So it's a great pleasure to have Professor Daniel Green from UC San Diego. And uh, uh, Daniel is a very, uh, uh, like, work on uh, quantum field theory and uh, cosmology uh, area. And he did a lot of work in this area. Uh, for students, just uh, a small introduction of Daniel. He did his PhD from Stanford with Eva Silverstein, who was also the speaker in our forum. And then uh, uh, he associated with uh, IAS Princeton, where he did his postdoc, first postdoc. Then he was at Stanford uh, uh, KITP. KITP, I think. Kaipak. Oh, KIPAC. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there he will uh, another did another postdoc, and then he was uh, at uh, CETA as an assistant professor for a one year, and then he shifted to Berkeley. There he was for one year, and from uh, 2017 or 18, you have joined. 17. 17. So from 2017, he's at California, San Diego. So he's uh, going to speak about uh, his work with uh, uh, Tim. Uh, this is the archive number. This is about the soft DC per effective theory. So Daniel, uh, thank you very much for giving this talk for USTM Zoominar series. You are the 38th speaker and uh, uh, we, Welcome you from Potsdam. So uh, you can start. Okay, well, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity and the invitation to talk. Um, so my, so that my understanding is this is a this group of students and it's a um, longer talk than I'm used to. So hope you'll bear with me with some of the bumps with such a long talk. Um, my plan is to, um, is mainly to discuss this paper with some background. So soft to effective theory is meant to address the problem of understanding the universe on scales much larger than the horizon, particularly for the sitter. Um, so to kind of to introduce that problem, we're going to discuss loops in the sitter space. So this is a topic that has a long and uh, mostly unfortunate history um, of confusion and disagreement in the literature. And I'll at least try to give you some flavor of why there is so much confusion and disagreement. Um, and at least sort of some of the technical aspects of how you calculate um, loop corrections to uh, inflationary or dissider correlators. Um, then once we understand the problems, we'll move on to um, introducing soft dissider effective theory and try to understand why that sh should make the problem better. And then we'll apply it to two cases, quantum fields in a fixed dissider background, so no dynamical gravity. And then we'll look finally at metric fluctuations um, during inflation or dissider, but inflation so that we include both the scalar metric fluctuations and tensor metric fluctuations. Okay, so the problem of describing the universe on the largest possible scales in a, uh, taking into account quantum mechanics is a problem that's confounded physicists uh, and artists alike. Uh, we don't seem to have even the simplest uh, conceptual version of what the universe should look like on these scales. Um, and this is tied to some really basic and important problems in physics. Um, so perhaps the easiest starting point is just to say, we don't understand eternal inflation. Um, we don't need, um, but this is also related to other problems like, is the sitter space fundamentally unstable? And if so, why? Um, but even more basically, and this ties into the problem of understanding eternal inflation, we're not sure what a theory of quantum to sitter space should even compute. We don't have a rigorous well-defined observable like the S matrix or the boundary correlators in ADS. And so a lot of the confusion already starts from whether the, the things, there's even a rigorous quantity that this theory is supposed to be calculating. Um, and often when you're in this situation, 
it's common to ask, you know, maybe the whole problem is we're not asking questions in the right way. So this is a common, this is how certain infrared divergences are dealt with in quantum field theory. And maybe you think the whole problem is just we haven't figured out what the right question to ask of the quantum universe even is. Um, now, you could also take a very pragmatic approach, uh, which is fairly common amongst cosmologists as leads, which, which is to say, well, this is, these are problems for understanding a new universe that maybe we don't even live in. Um, and maybe the resolution to all these problems is that, um, that we're just, we don't have to answer these questions because they're not observable or they're just not relevant to, to us. So do I really have to care about the fact we don't have these answers? But when we look at the cosmic microwave background, or we look at uh, structure in the universe, like galaxy, the distribution of galaxies um, or matter, um, it's not true that we don't, we don't have to worry about some, what's happening to super horizon modes or what the universe, quantum mechanical lo universe looks like on scales much larger than the horizon. Um, this is crucially why we need inflation, because we see that there were perturbations that existed on scales much larger than the horizon. And inflation itself uh, uses the evolution of modes on these scales to solve uh, the, pro the horizon problem and ultimately explain the observed uh, fluctuations we see in, in, in data. And in many models of inflation, it's exactly these quantum fluctuations um, that that get that are responsible for the existence of slow roll eternal inflation that are giving rise to the observed fluctuations. So um, we can't separate the problem of well, we don't know how to deal with a problem like eternal inflation from, but we understand these long wave the quantum fluctuations of these long wave like modes well enough to predict observations. And if there's something wrong with our understanding of the super horizon evolution then it, would, should all, it can ultimately affect the statistics of the fluctuations we observe, um, thus potentially being in, co in conflict with data. Um, so no matter how you look at it, we're, we have to have a, a way of understanding the evolution of let's say scalar fluctuations when their wave lengths are very large compared to the horizon, or said differently that their physical wave number is much smaller than than Hubble. So a simple example of this is the, um, the conservation of the scalar metric fluctuations. So it's, so in inflation, it's common to write the density, the ultimately adiabatic density fluctuations in terms of a pure metric fluctuation in this way I've written here where zeta is the is what describes the um, Daniel geometric. Yep. Isn't it one signature to be negative? Oh, sh sorry. Yeah, there should be a minus in front of the t's. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. There should be minus there. Um, okay. So. So it's it's long been known that this variable zeta um, freezes outside the horizon. So this is. So at the, the level of just a, uh, the a quadratic action or the Gaussian theory, it's relatively easy to see just by solving the equations of motion. Uh, with slightly more work, you can show that even nonlinearly, the classical equations of motion force zeta to go to zero outside the horizon. So the correlators become time independent. Um, now, it, much later, it's been shown that this is a, quantum mechanical statement and that to all orders in perturbation theory, the correlators uh, uh, become constants outside the horizon or the time derivative of zeta goes to zero outside the horizon. Now, um, these proofs at some level ultimately rest on diagrammatic arguments. So there's some general construction of a complicated diagram and one goes through it bit by bit to understand um, to, to show that somehow these loop corrections don't destroy this classical statement. So Daniel, I have a question. Yep. So this limit, is it called soft limit? Um, yeah, so, okay, so soft limits, um, yeah, here I'm being a bit, 
I'm, I'm being a bit sloppy. So normally, so here I'm thinking more of the super, the limit where I'm just taking one K to be super horizon or uh, ultimately okay. all the K super horizon. The soft limit more often refers to when you let all the modes become super horizon, um, okay. eventually, okay, so if this thing, if all of them become time independent, usually it's a statement that one K is much smaller than the other Ks. But yeah. here I'm just saying the physical wave number is very large. Okay. I but you, this is schematic. So sorry. I, this is just, oh, we'll get more, I'll try to be more precise as we go along through the. Through sure, the sure. Okay, so, um, so what's, what's frustrating about the state of these, these proofs is that Zeta is an essential piece of our understanding of cosmology. So at some really simple level, when we compute correlators from inflation, we often compute these zeta correlators while inflation is still going on. So we pick some time during inflation, but where all the fluctuations we care about are super horizon. So, and then we, so we compute some correlation functions then, but then when we wanna say compare it to data, we, re, we apply those correlators we calculated during inflation at some much later time, the time that say our, we start running our Boltzmann code, say around DVN or something like that. And we can use this conservation of zeta, this fact that we know that zeta is, cannot, is not changed outside the horizon to go interchangeably between these two things. But one sees that just the way even we think about how we constrain, observa the constrain observations from inflation, use constrained inflation from observations starts with this as an essential tool. Furthermore, when we apply things like, so now this is meant to be a soft theorem, we do have the single field consistency conditions, which are, which are constraints on correlation functions um, that relate say n point functions to n minus one point functions. The derivation of these results assume the conservation of zeta outside the horizon and these, the validity of these consistency conditions is actually one of the best ways we're gonna test inflation in the next generation of observations. So this, this result, this conservation of zeta has this incredibly important role in cosmology, observationally and technically. And so it's really strange that such something so important ultimately is understood because of some purely diagrammatic argument. So why, why don't we have a better understanding um, of, you know, just, just one question. So yep. here you have mentioned about the well-known three-point function. Now I'm just uh, asking if you just think of like higher point functions, there might be a possibility like uh, there are some diagrams are like connected and there are some diagrams are disconnected. Mm -hmm. So once you write down such kind of, uh, recursion relation or something like that, which part is the most dominant one, which contributes in the... Which part is the most, well, so there are, um, okay, so ultimately we, we care about the connected correlators for higher endpoint functions, Yeah. but there are multiple soft theorems, so like where you take a multiple momenta to be soft. Mm -hmm. um, the dom I mean, in all of these cases, the dominant information is not in the soft limit. So if you're asking about, um, except, okay, unless these can stop, unless the single field conditions are violated. Mm -hmm. So if there is a violation of the single field consistency condition, uh, it can arise in different configurations, but often it's the three point function that will have the most information, but it can be pushed in principle to higher endpoint functions. Okay, okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll go into this in, in detail in a second, but just to sort of chart the course of what the problem is. Um, so at some basic level, part of the problem is that when you go to calculate cosmological correlators using a, a prescription like dimensional regular, regularization, you find that it doesn't actually regulate your divergences. So for example, it's a common thing to encounter an integral like the following, ddp over p to the d. And this is infinite in every dimension. And so analytically continuing in D, which is what you would normally do in flat space, doesn't resolve anything. And so often the only way to get a simple understanding of what the loops are doing is to impose a hard cutoff. 
Now, hard cutoffs are problematic for a lot of reasons, um, but one of them we can see just this way. So let's take something, the, we take a contribution that naively looks like it falls off like many powers of the cutoff. So let's say P over AH to the fourth. So it's falling off like four, four powers of the scale factor, which is the integrand is fall, going to zero quickly as time evolves. So A is, is becoming large as the universe expands. Now, when we impose a hard cutoff, let's say we impose that cutoff at the horizon, then when we do this, we have this power law divergence in momentum. If we cut it off at some scale that's similar to AH, then when we go to integrate this in time, we would get something that's actually growing, like a power of T. So just at face value, if you're carrying around this, this uh, hard cutoff and you see a loop integral like this, it's not immediately obvious that it, it doesn't present a problem. Uh, in, in particular, couldn't lead to time evolution outside the horizon, even though the integrand falls off like four powers of the scale factor. And so one's always having to worry that the next diagram could destroy the nice behavior because you always have this possibility that there's a cancellation between the factors of A downstairs and the uh, hard cutoff upstairs. And ultimately what this is, is, a, is worrying about coupling between modes. So we're, we're say looking at, let's say we're looking at the evolution of the power spectrum. Um, what, we're, what we're worried about is some zeta with some momentum P that's still at horizon crossing while these modes are outside the horizon. And we're worried about the coupling between these short modes that are crossing the horizon all the time and these modes that are being redshifted to be increasingly long wavelengths. Part of the reason that we're worried about this is that we don't have great intuition for the sitter space. So in principle, you say, well, I have these particles being produced during, uh, from the expansion of the universe. Is it possible that all of these things crossing the horizon are somehow building up to change the time evolution on super horizon scales? And we don't have a great way of deciding one way or the other if this can happen. Okay. So, the resolution to this problem that we're gonna, we're gonna get to eventually in this talk is to use effective field theory. So in an effective field theory, the way you would approach this problem is say, look, the problem I have is that the scale that I'm interested in, which is, being, which is the universe on scales much larger than the horizon, I'm, I'm running into this problem that I have all of these modes these, that are much smaller uh, at the horizon or, or smaller that I'm trying to keep track of. In effective field theory, I would integrate those out first to arrive at a theory just of the scale that I care about. Now, this in in so in I mean, I have a question yep. regarding this effective field theory. So, there are, uh, as far as I know, there are two approaches to effective field theory. One is like uh, the top-down approach, which is like if you know the full theory, then if you uh, want to construct a low-energy theory you can integrate out few degrees of freedom and construct the effective theory. But the problem is knowing about the full theory. That's uh, like, I don't know how much that is possible. On the other hand, uh, there are other mechanisms to generate effective field theory from the uh, down, uh, down to top. Parma. Yeah. Yep. So like, uh, break. Okay, so we'll do both. We'll do both. Um, so, okay, so what I would say in answer to your question, now I, I'm gonna talk about this later. So again, this is just my introduction to motivate it. So I'll uh -huh. talk about all things in more detail, but um, just to foreshadow, there are different ways of thinking about effective field theory. Um, and I'll explain in detail which ones are which, but the okay. difference between top down and bottom up, what I would say is that um, the top down is often how you, you figure out what the right effective field theory is. But once you have a good effective field theory, you should always be able to do bottom up. So the, the thing is you might actually not, you might not know how to do bottom up without thinking from the, what the full theory is first. Okay. But in principle, if I, if I have a complete understanding of the universe on the scales as I know them, mm -hmm. I should be able to explain everything I see on, my, on the scale that I care about without ever referring to the microphysics. Um, okay. I, if I couldn't do that, then I don't have an effective theory because it says it's dependent 
on microphysics in a way that I can't explain within my effective field. Perfect. Uh, hi, Daniel. Uh, can I yep. can I ask? Sorry to slow you down. Uh, no, no problem. Can, can you just uh, can you just stress again what exactly is the problem with mode coupling? Uh, well, so the problem here, so the problem here is, in principle, there's nothing wrong with coupling. The problem here is that we don't have a good way to regulate the short wavelength modes. So we're, introdu so we're introducing a hard cutoff as a practical tool because it's really hard to calculate. We don't have a good regulator for removing the short distance mode. So in flat space Q of T, the short distance modes don't bother you at all because dim reg is very effective at getting rid of all the short distance physics. Yeah. Whereas in, in the sitter, we're, con we're combining two problems. So first, so the first problem is a purely technical problem. I see a power law divergence that, and I'm just cutting it off and I'm saying, well, I should probably include all the way up to the scales that I think are important to inflation, which is includes the horizon. So I'm doing this loop, but I ha that's power law divergence, divergent, but I'm keeping scales very short compared to the wavelength I care about. The second is the conceptual problem. Is it possible that physics crossing the horizon is creating all of these effects? And the reason that mode coupling, I'm getting confused about this effect is that it's really physically possible that the coupling of short and long wavelengths modes is capable of changing the behavior of the, the problem. And so, um, so it's, it's both things. It's that technically we don't have a good way of dealing with the mode coupling of short and long wavelength modes in loops because there's not a good regulator um, that preserves the symmetries and various other things. And then this conceptual question of what's even possible in the sitter space. And this is why people think that this, you know, we'll do some calculation and claim that it proves the sitter space is fundamentally unstable is that we don't have a good way of understanding what the calculations even mean when we do them. So we do some calculation, something, and then we don't, but we don't have a good way of interpreting the result. All right, thanks. Okay, so the, 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 the reason, the key with a, uh, that a, of why effective field theory works really comes down to this technical but remarkable fact um, that we can, when we look at say the path integral for a problem where we have say long wavelength, which I'll call soft, so soft modes and hard modes, we can integrate out the hard modes, we can perform the path integral over some of the fields, say the fields with small, wave uh, with, with small wave number with large wave number or small small wavelength and keep only the fields that we care about that let's that deal with the scale of the problem we're interested in and after integrating out the short the the hard modes we're still left with some local effective action so we can describe entirely the theory that that the scales we're interested in in isolation with the same path integral type way of thinking about it as the full theory with both the hard and soft modes. This fact tells you that all that the hard modes are doing is changing the parameters of this, this effective action. And so this is the remarkable fact about decoupling that makes so, so much of effective field theory work, which is that all of these details that we're worrying about are just about the details of what the effective action, of the, the coefficients of the effective action. And this is exactly the problem we're encountering when we're doing these loop cor corrections in the sitter. So we're doing a calculation where we're running the, we're, 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 we're doing a loop over momentum, but we're keeping it all the way up to the hard cutoff. So we're including hard modes, the modes that are, param that are, that are have uh, large momenta compared to the modes we care about. Now, if, this if we had a proper effective field theory, we would know that only that these modes are all they're doing is changing the coefficients of the effective action. And so all we're worrying about these modes is just a detail about what the action, the coefficients in our action is. And, and even better, if we had a, a proper EFT, we would calculate in such a way that these kinds of loops don't change the power counting. So if we what we're really interested in is momenta wave number k over a h that's very small, then when we see a loop that has the units of four powers of k, 
then the answer will scale like k over a h to the fourth, which goes to zero. So the purpose of the rest of the talk is to show that we can do this. So I haven't explained how this is going to work or why, but this is the goal, which is just when you, that when you do flat space quantum field theory and you see power law divergences, or you see any loop integral that has certain units of momentum, uh, when, you're doing a, when you're doing effective theory, you just count those like the long wave point. And so the question is, how do we get there? How do we get to the point where we can understand these loop momenta in this way? Okay, so now I'm going to get into the more technical parts that was to motivate what we're going to do through the rest of the time. Okay, so as a starting point, we're going to work with, into, we'll almost entirely work into sitter space. So we're going to, but occasionally I'll alternate between two descriptions. Uh, there's, but in all cases, I'll use the cosmological slicing of the sitter. So we'll cover the whole space but it's the one that's relevant to say inflation and it will capture much of what we're interested in. So the first is in real time. So this is, I'll use, this is T and you have exponential growth in time so that the scale factors grows like E to the HT where H is the Hubble constant during, for, and it is a constant in De Sitter and approximately constant during inflation. Alternatively, so this will be the best way to think about our effective theory is in terms of real time. Um, when dealing with full descender calculations, it's often more useful to use conformal time. So conformal time is, tau, is often denoted tau. Other, you might also see it written as eta. Um, these are usually the two choices for conformal time for cosmologists. Um, in conformal time, so in real time, T, time goes from zero to infinity. In conformal time, the, the past is minus infinity and the future where A becomes infinite is tau equals zero. And the, med, and the, 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 scale, the scale factor in these conformal coupling in terms of conformal time is one over minus H tau. This, this conformal time is useful though, is, is particularly useful for doing these calculations, although it's sometimes counterintuitive because you know, tau, tau equals zero is the future and you're carrying around these minus signs all over the place because it's negative. Related to this, there's also often two ways we can think about what's happening in the sitter. So there's the physical wave length or wave number picture where the horizon is a fixed scale. So one that's the curvature scale, let's say, or it's one over the Hubble parameter. Um, and this is, this is sort of the scale that sets the, the local particle horizon. And as time evolves, wavelengths are being stretched like the scale, they're proportionally to the scale factor. So they're being redshifted as the universe is expanding during inflation. And so what we're, we're going to care about is the limit where these things are much bigger than the horizon. So the time evolution stretches it to the point that the wavelength is much bigger than the horizon scale. An alternate picture that will, will also be helpful is to think in terms of co-moving wave numbers. So co-moving wave number uh, or, or co-moving wavelength or the co-moving wave number K is a constant. And this is useful because in our FRW slicing, we had time, we had spatial translations for symmetry. So we go back here, we can shift X by a constant <coughs> and it leaves the action invariant. So the co-moving wave number is convenient because it's a conserved quantity, because it's the, it's the conserved quantity associated with the, the translation symmetry of, this, of the slicing. And so when doing calculations, it's useful because you know that these numbers k don't evolve in time, don't evolve in time. And so in contrast, what's happening is that the co-moving horizon is shrinking. So we're waiting until a time where the co-moving horizon is much smaller, again, than the, co uh, than the, the co-moving wavelength. Um, and all we've done is move this power, this factor of the scale factor A into the definition of the horizon instead of in terms of the physical wave. Now to get some intuition from the UV, we'll consider for the most part, we'll consider interacting scalar fields into sitter space. So here I have a, um, a phi four theory with some massive scalar. 
Um, we'll consider, we can consider both massless and massive, but all will, all, both cases will teach us something about, uh, about distributed space. In conformal time, this is written in the following way. So there's these different powers of, H, of minus HT uh, that go in the denominator um, related to the overall square root of G that sits out front and the contractions of the metric associated with derivatives. Now here, what, this is already at this level where you can see that why we need something like an effective theory. Because if I care about the behavior in the long wavelength limit, there's no obvious way to power count um, what, the, what terms in this action are important. So for example, if you were thinking about, um, if you were thinking about flat space quantum field theory, you would often say, well, what, the first thing you would do is you'd pound count the dimensions of the operators. You'd say, this counts like energy to the ninth, and it's suppressed by some UV, it, it's suppressed by some UV scale to the fourth, and so this is a small number. But here I have these inverse powers of T of tau floating around. Um, and so I don't even have a good intuition for which of these terms will be more important than any others. And it doesn't seem to depend on mass, the powers of t, the tau that float around. And so just by looking at the action, you can't decide what's happening at all. So the next step is you usually just start solving the equations. So you under, try to understand what's going on by brute force. So here, this is where we'll use the co-moving, we'll start using the co-moving wave number. So here is just, because I have translations in space, it makes sense to Fourier transform. And so this co-moving wave number K is just the Fourier transform of the spatial coordinates. However, because I don't have time translations, I don't want a Fourier transform in time. And so I, I arrive at this sort of mixed representation where I, I'm solving in terms of time, but I've Fourier transformed in space. Now using the, action, the quadratic action and finding the equations of motion, you arrive at this typical equation for a massive scalar field in a distributed background. You can solve this uh, relatively easily, well, easily with Mathematica um, to arrive at a solution in terms of, of Hankel functions. So here I, I'm agnostic about the coefficient. So again, I'll have to fix initial conditions somewhere, but the time evolution is fixed by the Hankel functions. Um, these Hankel functions have, are determined by this parameter nu which itself is related to the mass. So uh, nu has the property that when m goes to zero, uh, nu goes to three, half, three halves. So nu of three halves is the, mass, the massless case. In the massless case, it's a feature of these Hankel functions, or you can just solve it your, independently. So just solving the original equation, that these most functions simplify significantly in the, when nu is three halves. And it takes this, this form um, that it goes like one over k to the three halves. And then uh, this oscillatory piece, which we would we'll get in general. And then this slightly unusual one plus i k tau upstairs. Now the feature of this, uh, this solution is that when tau goes to zero, which is the future infinity, so that I'm letting the mode wavelength redshift. So I'm taking k tau to be very small. This goes to a constant um, and it's proportional to one over k to the three halves. There's another case that's particularly interesting uh, and because, in part because it's very simple and easy to understand is the case of conformal mass. So this, is, um, this corresponds to m squared is two h squared or nu equals to one half. And this is the mass that corresponds to taking a massless scalar in flat space and then conformally mapping it to the sitter space. So in this case, the mode functions simplify again. Um, now they look exactly like flat space mode functions, except for this funny power of tau up front. And that power of tau is exactly what you expect from the conformal map from flat space, because the, the, the field phi has dimension one. And so when you do the map from flat space to the sitter space, you pick up a power of one over A from the conformal map. And so this again is a very useful example because if you understand how, if you have a good understanding of, of how conformal symmetry acts, you can often guess the answer. 
by just taking, if we take now nu equals one half in all of our formulas and compute something, we should recover much of flat space or at least be able to understand what happens from taking flat space and conformally mapping it to the system. So Daniel, yep. uh, so here you have taken A and you have chosen B to be zero. Can you please comment on that? That why this oh, is- so, Oh, so I haven't done either either one yet. Right here, I, so I'm going to get how you make a choice. Here, I'm just telling you what the end of, what one, that the Hankel one does. Uh, okay. And Hankel two is a complex conjugate of Hankel one. True. So I haven't, I haven't made any specific choices yet. I'm just telling you about the classical solutions right now. Uh, okay. Right, because we can look at it here. H1 and H2 are just complex conjugates of each other. True. So if I know what one does, I know what the other one's doing. True. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so now here's where I actually uh, have to, I, I actually pick a solution. Um, so where we actually get our precise solutions from is from, from actually defining this as a quantum field theory. So the most practical thing to do with cosmological correlators is to canonically quantize. So again, we treat this with creation annihilation operators. Um, and we'll define the creation and annihilation operators to have their usual commutation relation, um, the same you would expect for flat space. Now, there are two conditions that come in, so that, that determine what these background solutions are. So phi bar here is a classical solution to the equations of motion. And so I have an unknown amplitude, so I don't know what the overall constant that sits in front of that, our, our solutions on the previous slide were. So here I have A's and B's, and I need to pick my A's and B's. So the first condition is that it lives in the, the so-called Bunch-Davies vacuum. Um, there are multiple ways to define that, but roughly speaking, the, the best way to get intuition for how to find the Bunch-Davies vacuum is what I'm actually looking for is that when I take a mode to be very high wavelength, I want, I, it should look to leading approximation like it lives in flat space. In flat space, the way we would quantize the scalar field, so that in empty flat space, is such that I, um, I create positive frequency modes. So the choice here is such that when I create, I act with the creation, I, or the, I act on the vacuum, I'm creating only positives and not negative frequency modes. And so that picks out only one of the two Hankel functions because the Hankel functions have this character that they're the Hankel, the reason I've written in terms of Hankel functions and not the J and Y Bessel functions is that the Hankel functions have either positive or negative frequency. And so I care about isolating just the positive frequencies. Um, so this physically corresponds to the choice of being in a state that has no particles in it. So if I took a different combination, which in principle I'm allowed to do, in fact, there's an entire family of De Sitter invariant vacua that correspond to taking both H1 and H2. Um, those correspond to states with particles in them. And so if I really want to talk about empty space, then what I want is, is the positive frequencies. The next, so that fixes, that, that picks out one of the two. The second condition is that I want the, I want to have the canonical commutation relation. So here I've written it in terms of phi and phi dot. Of course, the other way you would write it is to take the action and compute the co conjugate momenta to phi, which is a cubed times phi dot. And so, the con so what you have is just, this is the standard commutator of phi and, and p gives you a delta function with an i. And so that sets the overall normalization of these things. Now, and so solving that problem gives you this phase and these, this, particularly the hard part to get is the square root of pi over two, I would say. Um, and so all of that comes from imposing these conditions. Okay, so now if I take, so if I, I take that as my answer, I can compute things like the two point function of the Gaussian theory. So here, what you do is you would say just take literally take these answers, use the canon the canonical quantization to um, to just solve the problem of computing correlators by Wick contraction. You would pick out just one combination of A and A dagger that's not annihilating the vacuum, and commute it to get the following answer. Um, 
the important details here are only that there's some overall stuff that just comes from the normalization of the mode function. Phi has dimension one, so it almost, it always comes with these powers of h squared in it. And then depending on the mass, so nu is control, controls the mass, it goes like one over k to the two nu, and then tau to the three minus two nu. I'm pointing this out only because it's useful to get some intuition that remember when nu, the massless limit corresponds to nu going to three halves. And indeed in that case, we see the tau dependence vanishes and we get one over k cubed, which is the standard answer. And as we increase the mass, nu decreases and now we see things that fall off like powers of tau as tau goes to zero in the future. So Daniel, what is mu? What is, oh, uh, that was supposed to be new. I think I mistyped. Oh. Sorry, that's my bad. Um, okay, so, um, so again, these things always come with this overall momentum conserving delta function. So you'll always get a moment, uh, every time you compute a correlator into sitter space, you have moment, this co-moving momentum conservation. So it'll be two pi cubed times a delta function. Um, and so it will be useful to define a correlator, this primed correlator, which is just the full correlator with this overall momentum conserving delta function stripped off. So I'm gonna write correlators without always writing this two pi cube delta function of the sum of co-moving momenta. And that's because it's just assumed that every correlator I will write will have that in it. Uh, in addition, I will always be computing this thing in the interacting Bunch-Davies vacuum. So all my correlators will be understood to be Bunch-Davies correlators. Okay, so now we're ready to move on to, to the problem of calculating loops. Um, so the standard uh, type of quantity we calculate in cosmology are called in-in correlators. So the idea here is we're calculating the correlation function of some operator or some product of operators at some, some time, which we're all usually interested in the future. So we're computing it in the far future, <coughs> but the the one but what we care about is that it's prepared in a particular state in the past so this is a correlator computed in in a particular in state which again we're taking to be the interacting bunch bunch davies vacuum so to understand how that works technically is that if we use the interaction picture we evolve the vacuum on both sides so we have to use so we have evolved the left using this time ordered exponential in the interacting Hamiltonian and on the right or the anti time ordered on the left, the time ordered on the right. And the fact that it doesn't group itself into a single time ordering is related to the fact that the, the infinite past is what appears on both sides. And both of them are being evolved to the specific time where we've defined our operator. Now I've also written the I epsilon prescription here. And it's important to note that the I epsilon prescription on the left and right is different. So notice that on the left, I have I, both are going to minus infinity in the past, but on the left, it goes to plus I epsilon. On the right, it goes to minus I epsilon. And this, this fact is precisely related to the choice of vacuum. And it's there to ensure that when I define my modes to have positive frequencies, that when they, the positive frequencies are on the right, and this minus I epsilon ensures that those become exponentially suppressed. And the complex conjugate of those appears on the left. And those ones will again be exponentially suppressed because I've flipped the sign of I epsilon. Now, this that can be- uh, yep. This formalism is uh, basically the schwinger keldish type of formalism. Yes, correct. Yeah, correct, so, this is similar. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, similar to, to thermal correlators too. So, um, um, but okay, well, we can understand this is also just being computing correlators with the following time ordering, which is also related to, to schwinger keldesh um, So what, the one way we're thinking about this, we're computing a time ordered correlator uh, or a contour or order, ordered correlator. Yes. Where we're evaluating the operators at this point tau naught. They're coming in from plus I, I infinite, minus infinity plus I epsilon minus infinity. And then they're going out to minus I epsilon infinity yeah. along this blue curve. So the blue curve here is the standard I epsilon prescription. Yep, go ahead. Is that a question? No, no. Okay, so 
so here, so now in standard Schrodinger Kaldesh, what you would do is you would double the degrees of freedom. You would say, I, I might have a degrees of freedom that live on the top branch of this blue line and a separate degrees of freedom that live on the bottom branch. So now I have two time, because I'm integrating over the same range of time, I might want to keep track of the, the part of the time integral that's on the top and the bottom separately. We won't have to do that um, for reasons that two different reasons, and the EFT is a different reason than in the full answer. Um, for the purpose of doing the full calculations in the, in the complete theory, it's often convenient to just completely wick rotate this problem. So what one does is one wick rotates the top, uh, the, the top blue line to the top part of this red curve and the bottom blue line to the bottom part of this red curve such that the in-in correlator becomes an anti-time order cor correlator along this um, now purely imaginary conformal time. And we integrate from plus infinity to minus infinity in this Euclidean time tau. And in fact, we still keep track of the time of the operators now by the offset of this line. So this line is offset from the, from, from the, re the imaginary axis by this amount tau naught. And that's what keep track of where we're putting the operators. Now, you can apply this. There's applying this formalism is relatively straightforward at tree level. So, for example, if I take if I want to calculate the tree level four point function in lambda phi to the four, I would just bring down one power of the interaction. I would do a bunch of wick contractions to arrive at this integral. So I, I bring down the integral, so the leading order in the interacting Hamiltonian. You do a bunch of wick contractions, which pull out just the mode functions. And this gives you the, the following structure. And now you're just left with doing the integral. Um, it turns out that for conformal mass, which I've chosen here, the powers of tau in, that are associated with this, the, the square root of, the, met, of the, the determinant of the metric cancel with the powers of tau that are in the mode function. So you're left just doing an integral over an exponential. So you're just doing integral of d tau Euclidean e to the minus k total tau, where k total is the sum of the length of all of these vectors. And you get this relatively simple answer. The, uh, the coupling, the, the phi four coupling, and then one over the sum of the momenta, k, k, the length of the vectors, k1 plus k2 plus k3 plus k4 and then the individual powers, k1, 2, 3, 4. Now this structure is actually now very well understood. Um, and there's been a, a lot of progress understanding these general tree level correlators for arbitrary spins and interactions. Um, and one of the things that's what's now well understood is that this pole in one over k total is related to the S matrix. So in particular, uh, if you strip off, so there's the pole and these powers of k, one, two, three, four. If you strip all of that off, you have the tree level S matrix associated with this action, which indeed for a, um, for an interacting scale, lambda phi, for an interacting scalar is just a constant, which related to, to phi. So in the structure of these poles, you should, you should understand um, as, as having some well understood structure. Immediately, when you go to loop level, you'll run into problems. So we have a fairly well-developed understanding of tree-level diagrams. But once you run into loops, all of this sort of nice structure that, that has been understood kind of is lost um, for a variety of technical reasons. So the simplest possible version to understand why you have problems is you take a massless scalar. So if I have a massless scalar, um, I, and I just do, let's say, a trivial wick contraction of some correlator um, such that I have to do, uh, the, I just have to do a loop over one wick contraction. Because in D dimensions, the two-point function of a, a massless scalar field goes like one over P to the D. So that's just the propagator of a massless scalar field we'll have a one over p to the d in it. When you go to do this loop integral, you get exactly this kind of divergence that we described, this problematic 
DDP over P to the D that's infinite in every dimension. Furthermore, the divert it has both UV and IR divergences. So this diverges as P goes to zero and P goes to infinity. Neither one of these divergences is regulated by using DIMREG. And so all, so if you've looked at trying to understand loops of massless scalars, this one in particular will drive you crazy because you end up seeing calculations that impose both a hard IR and a hard, U, hard UV cut. And both of them are done in totally different ways. It's not at all obvious why they're able to pick either choice. Now, I, I do want to emphasize that while it's the easiest version of the problem to see, you thinking that it's restricted to this specific case of a massless scalar would make you think that there's a special problem of calculating loops for only one particular kind of field. And that would mean that the center correlators in any other context are easy to handle. And this is actually also not true. So um, when one encounters the same issue with divergences, um, even for massive correlators, where you'd think they're better behaved because they fall off with time. So there's no equivalent, and you might think there's no equivalent of the IR type problems from things that survive to late times. But it's actually relatively easy to see that even for a conformal mass scalar, if you compute things like composite operators, you'll again run into um, these types of problems. So let's say, let's take the problem of computing the two point function of the composite operator phi squared. Um, so at some basic level, that's the same as computing two momentum integrals over the four point function. Now in flat space, um, if it's a textbook example um, in a number of quantum, your favorite quantum field theory textbooks, that phi, this phi squared operator requires an anomalous dimension at one loop. So it's the easiest case of computing an anomalous dimension because it occurs in phi four theory at one loop. Um, now, I've intentionally chosen the conformal mass because, again, because when, when this thing is conformal, we'll have a better handle of what should be happening because we can get to the, the De Sitter answer by conformally mapping from flat space. So the fact that this, there's an anomalous dimension of flat space suggests that there's some kind of interesting late time behavior like an anomalous dimension that will show up in De Sitter space. Now, if we go and just take this written answer, so we take the, this two point function I'm calculating is just an integral over the four point function. And I take the four point function I've calculated here. <coughs> then in the limit where one momenta is large and the other one is small and comparable to K, you'll, and you just tailor expand the integrand, you arrive at the following uh, structure. So you'll, fat, you'll get a piece that looks like D3P over P, D3P2 over P plus K plus P, P2. That piece is just, the, that structure there is the usual two point function tree level or flat, uh, the, the Gaussian two point function of this composite operator. But now it's multiplied by this D3P over P cubed, exactly this kind of divergence that we didn't like for massless correlators. Now this piece here has UV and IR divergences. The IR is regulated in the full answer because here I've Taylor expanded. So eventually when P1 becomes comparable to K, the, 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 the divergence as P1 goes to zero is regulated by, by keeping finite K. But it's still UV divergent in this way that's not regulated by, they will also not be regulated by analytically continuing in dimension or even in the mass. The only way to deal with either of these divergences turns out at this level to work completely non-perturbatively in K. So I can't understand the structure of this answer in, without keeping all possible powers of K, which is incredibly frustrating because these integrals are often very difficult to do if I'm not allowed to tailor expand them before calculating. Um, and so, Part of the reason that one gets, ends up back at using a hard cutoff in many cases is that these integrals, unless you know how to do them exactly, 
are not regulated by dimension, um, either in the UV or the IR um, uh, with dimensional regularization. But here again, just to bring it up, we get this same D3P over P cubed structure, which is difficult to handle, um, but this had nothing to do with the two point function of a massless scalar. It's not that that one over P cubed is because I took literally M to zero. This was already true for M squared equals two H squared. I still get these kinds of divergences. Now, with some great amount of care um, and keeping all of the cadence, calculate this thing in four minus epsilon dimensions, and you will arrive at something that looks like a dim reg answer. Um, so I don't want to go into the details because, again, part of the point of this talk is to show that with effective field theory, we can simplify these calculations significantly. Um, but the only point here is, to, rec is to, to see the structure. And this is a common structure you'll see for many loop calculations if you succeed in regulating them in a controlled way. So the overall factor of k to the 1 minus epsilon over a to the 4, uh, 4 delta phi, where delta is the dimension of phi in 4 minus epsilon dimensions, this is the structure that's just expected for on dimensional grounds for a phi squared correlator. Um, now, at this, this one loop contribution, or this, this loop contribution, gives you a 1 over epsilon pole. This is, again, this is the common flat space EFT of uh, uh, quantum field theory type structure. But now there's actually two terms that look divergent. So you can always can take a, a, a loop calculation into sitter space and organize the divergences into these two kinds of divergences. So the, it, it, you can show that without loss of generality, you can always break it up into mu over h divergences and k tau divergences. So the mu over h divergence um, has a nice interpretation as being the, the RG that's happening inside the horizon. So this is flat space RG. And we're just reading the, the, the ordinary flat space RG uh, that would happen in, um, off in our decider correlator. Whereas the K tau divergence is really the time evolution after horizon crossing. So because these are really physically different things. Um, and the fact, and particularly the appearance of physical time and physical wave number in the second one, and only some dimensions of unit, some, some constant h and some, um, and the renormalization scale mu in the first term makes it clear that these are really physically distinct things. So the first case actually has a really nice interpretation. How do you deal with these log mu over h divergences? Well, the solution is just you always set mu is equal to h. And then all of these logs will be zero. Um, now that seems like a funny cheat, and you'd say, well, why am I why am I always allowed to do that? And the answer is that there's really only one energy scale in the sitter space, the, the Hubble scale. And the reason that you get these mu over h divergences is the same way you'd say I get I get if I was dealing with a problem, a scattering problem with center of mass energy E, that it's convenient to take the renormaliza re renormalization scale to be the same as the center of mass energy of my collision. So all we're doing is we're, is we're doing the same thing here. We're saying there's one scale in the problem, h. There's no other scales. So I should just define all my couplings at that scale. So I don't do rg. I just say if I define my couplings at the scale h, then I don't have to rg at all, because there's only one scale in the problem. In but contra, uh, Daniel, uh, this yep. uh, scale, uh, the thing you said, so th this, this uh, thing is identified to be the heavy fields. So, okay, so um, let's see, is that, it, it's not, in a certain sense, yes, really here it's, this is the contribution from loops in flat space. Like this is a prop, this is a prop, like this is basically saying this same exact log would have been there in flat space. Uh -huh. And in, but in, in flat space, it would have been like mu over E, where E is oh, like the, okay, okay. the problem. But here, the energy of the problem is always the same, it's H. It's, like we, it's fixed by the expansion of the universe, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're, it's vacuum correlators and the center. We don't get to choose the initial conditions. 
So we don't have this like E factor. We just literally have, this is the energy of the problem, H. And so we just fix the couplings at H and we're done. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is really different than the K tau's because the K tau, the K tau logs are always large logs. So if we remember our formula for what tau was in terms of AH, this log is really K over AH, which is by definition, the parameter we want to be, we want K over H to be small, which corresponds to a large, a large log. And so no matter what we're doing, we're going to have to figure out how to handle these large logs. Now this log here is really just a reflection of time evolution. So you could write K over AH uh, as just AH at horizon crossing divided, divided by AH today, because horizon crossing by definition is the time when K is the time when K is equal to AH. And then when you take the log using the fact that H is a constant and A is E to the HT, this log is just the difference of the two is H times the, the length of time between horizon crossing and when you actually observe the mode. <clears throat> and so these logs are building up the time evolution from horizon crossing to some future point. Now we deal, we'll ultimately deal with these logs in exact analogy with RG, but it goes by the name dynamical RG because it has to do with a time parameter. It's not some, it's not a, a purely fiducial parameter mu, but there's really some physical time involved. But we'll still follow the same tricks. So the key idea is to regulate, is to renormalize the operator. So you'll introduce some, some constant prefactor z, which is our wave, our renormal, our wave function normalization of the operator. And now we just pick, we pick some made up times. These are purely made up numbers, tau star and k star. They're just made up parameters. But I pick this, I, I'm picking the counter terms that are defined in z to make, to remove the one over epsilon. And I've already removed the mu over h by picking mu is equal to h. And now I just pick this so that the log becomes small. So I pick, so now I've picked this k star tau star so the k tau naught over k star tau star, which is what I end up with, is I hope to be a small log. And I've, I've picked this, I've defined mu is equal to h, so I'm, I'm, I'm keeping track of the fact that the coupling is kept at h by defining lambda h. So now again, I just follow standard RG, and I say, look, these parameters k star and tau star are unphysical. So no physical answer should depend on which k star and tau star I choose. They were just convenient tools to make these logs small. But ultimately, even though the logs are small, physics should be independent of k star and tau star. And so writing this operator, oh, I, I messed up. It should be, my kalins avancic equation should be d log k tau, sorry. Um, but just write, you can write this statement that the physics is independent of k star and tau star as a differential equation. And this differential equation, by some simple manipulation, it becomes the kalins avancic equation. So the same way that you can resum the, you can compute two point functions um, using the kalins of, using the kalins avancic equation in flat space, we're doing the same thing. But now this kalins avancic equation is derived using this dynamical RG. But you'll you'll arrive at exactly the same structure that d log I got the log k tau of the two point function of this operator is proportional to something that just looks like the dimension of the operator where the, the operator dimension has been corrected by gamma, where gamma I've literally defined to be the anomalous dimension proportional to lambda over uh, eight pi squared. So which is basically nothing but writing the beta function. This is, uh, so, so this, this, this is a this is a Kalinsomancic equation for a composite operator. So gamma here is not a beta function; it really is an anomalous dimension. Yes. So the beta function is for all of the couplings, but yeah. the, the anomalous dimensions are operator by operator. Okay. <clears throat> and so in this case, you can solve this to just get this uh, power law solution. This is just telling you this correction we calculated is just correcting the power law behavior and will give us the following answer for the two point function. So it looks exactly like the answer before, modified by this anomalous dimension. 
And in fact, this anomalous dimension is the flat space anomalous dimension for the phi squared operator, precisely because if I really worked in four minus epsilon dimensions, I could go to a conformal fixed point, the Wilson Fisher fixed point, and conformally map the Wilson Fisher fixed point to de Sitter space because they're both, everything is conformal at that point. And then this has to be the answer where gamma, where, where this gamma is the literal anomalous dimension of the phi squared operator at the Wilson Fisher fixed point. And so we all, at, at some level, in four minus epsilon dimensions, we could have guessed this answer without doing any work. But now what we've accomplished in the meantime is an answer that still holds was if we take epsilon to zero, so that we're living in four dimensions. In that case, the, the key difference between, so the intuition about in flat space is that lambda phi to the four runs to zero. So if I perturb by lambda, lambda is marginally irrelevant. And eventually if I wait long enough, it runs to zero. But here, because of this fact that really there's a fixed energy scale in the problem H, is that I perturb by lambda in the UV and it runs only to H and acquires some finite non-zero value. And I just evaluate all my anomalous dimensions as if, as if they're in flat space, but calculated with a coupling fixed at one energy scale. Okay, so just to conclude this introductory, this background, um, this is a problem that will persist in general. So I've computed this one example, the phi squared correlator, but we'll when we'll encounter this same problem for any correlators for the following very simple to understand reasons. So the first is just to understand these bunch Davies correlators and the way they're suppressed. So bunch Davies, by definition, turned all of these os oscillatory things into negative exponentials. So if we integrate in either time or momenta, the early time and high momentum region of those integrals is suppressed exponentially. So for example, if I take, if I take the, the, the time integral first, then if I see an, an integral of this form, d tau, tau to some power, and then e to the minus tau times some momentum p, then doing this integral will just give me one over p to some power. So my integrals, my sort of dimensional analysis says, replace p taus by one over p's, and that will give you a fairly good intuition. Now, what, th what this means though, is that you're getting a finite answer coming from physical momenta that are of order h. So exactly these modes that are her at horizon crossing are giving us non-zero contributions all the time. So what that also means though is inc increasing the number of powers of P never changes the convergence properties of these integrals. These integrals scale like get order one contributions no matter how many powers of the physical momenta you get because this exponential means you're always picking up contributions where the momenta are at horizon crossing. So by dimensional now, this is in contrast to flat space. So in flat space, if I add more powers of P, then I just get things that, that vanish in dimensional regularization. And whereas in de Sitter space, adding powers of P doesn't change the way the answer behaves. They, are, they only change things by order one coefficients. So in, but in, in dimensional regularization and flat space, the reason that these things didn't contribute is what came back to this fact about effective theory. They basically said, all of this junk that's happening at high P is just changing the coefficients of the action. So what, if, I, if I choose the way that I calculate conveniently, I'll just define the way that this works so that those changes to the action are zero. And dimensional regularization is just an implementation of this idea instead of a finite correction by putting a hard cutoff, I'm just getting a zero correction by calculating in a clever way. But ultimately, all of that information about the UV is just encoded in the coupling constants. In De Sitter, what the problem we're having is that these things are keep giving, giving us non-zero contributions. And so even if there were no, they're, they're only changing the coefficients of the effective action, that fact is maybe not obvious from the outset, and furthermore, even if it was, I keep having to change the coefficients of the action. And it'll be this annoying process of every time I calculate a loop, I have to go back and change some coefficient in the action by some finite amount. And this is really a consequence of the fact that I'm keeping modes all the way inside the horizon. So I care about momenta 
that are very small compared that are I care about wave lengths that are very large compared to the horizon size. But I'm keeping things not just up to the horizon, but all the way inside because I want to continue these things all the way into flat space. <clears throat> and so it's these it's really this fact that I have multiple scales in the problem that's 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 causing me trouble. And so that's the problem we're going to solve with effective filtering. Okay, so now we're ready to build the effect, uh, the soft desider effective theory. So this effective theory is different than other effective theories um, for cosmology or particularly inflation in the following way. So the effective theory of inflation, um, as an example, you really keep modes all the way inside the horizon. So I really write down an action that's defined up to some much higher energy scale, usually, usually at least the scale associated with the background. And then I follow the fluctuations as they redshift from inside the horizon to outside the horizon to compute the correlators. But here, all we want to do is understand what's happening in the long wavelength universe. So we'll, we'll get rid of that entire region and we're, we want to only isolate what, hap what the universe looks like on super horizon scale. So our EFT is going to live in this blue region where all the modes have very small wave number, wave, uh, wave number compared to the, the inverse horizon. <clears throat> okay, so the next step is what we want to figure out is what is the right, what are the right variables to describe the long wavelength universe? So we can go back to the uh, quadratic equations of motion and just solve them. This is, again, without usually the best place to start in constructing an EFT is just to take an example and figure out what the sort of right way to think about it in the limit you care about is. So here we care about the limit where k goes to zero, the long wavelength limit. So we'll just solve the equations of motion in the limit where k, where k is zero. So for a massive field, that's relatively easy to solve. And you'll find that you get two power laws in the scale factor. Um, one that falls off more slowly. So both of them fall off for a massive scalar field, fall off like some power of the scale factor. Um, the one that falls off more slowly, we call the growing mode. Um, and here to relate the, the power to nu, it goes like three halves minus nu. And the decaying mode falls off faster. It falls off like three halves plus nu. Another way to, to, to describe this is to say there's two powers, alpha and beta, and alpha plus beta equals three is, is the property of those two, those two uh, quantities. And we'll always take alpha to be the smaller of alpha, of alpha and beta. So now our strategy for our EFT is simply to describe fluctuations as not being fluctuations around zero, but fluctuations around these long wavelength solutions. So, we'll break our field into these two kinds of solutions. The, the, the decaying, the growing mode that, that falls off like a power of a, a to the minus alpha. And we'll just factor out the obvious part that comes from the, the, the quadratic action, the a h to the minus alpha. And then we'll keep the fluctuation of that piece, phi plus. Then we'll add a new field, phi minus, which describes the decaying mode. And again, we'll factor out the overall time behavior. Um, a h to the minus beta. So these are the two soft modes. And then of course, there are still the hard modes that we're gonna have to integrate out. So uh, uh, Daniel, what is alpha and beta here? So here they're, gen so here they're the same numbers. So, so oh, far I'm just- Okay, okay, okay. See, just uh, so this would appear, true, true, yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just, I'm literally just promoting the C's in this formula to fields. Ah, and now I'm okay. going to use that to try to solve the theory. So in a you are different somehow rewriting the solution in a way. Yes. All, right here, all I've done is rewrite the solution. Exactly. Ah, okay. Now, this, this way of kind of guessing what the EFT is by rewriting the solution is similar to what's done in heavy quark effective theory. Um, and there, it's trying to understand how to think about the, what happens when a field is very massive. Um, ah. But but the similar ideas, we're just guessing a good ensemble. Now, oh, the, thing okay. that's nice, the thing that's nice about this ensemble, and in particular, the reason I factored out some powers of H, is that with this ensemble, phi plus and phi minus will be scaling operators. So you can think of them as carrying powers of K to the alpha or K to the beta. True. Now, in addition, I have these hard modes. Um, I, I won't prove it here, but you can show that integrating out the hard modes will give you back a local action. So 
we'll just try to understand the structure of the EFT. That that will be some technical argument that that one that's that's in the paper. Okay. Okay. So if you if you wanted to understand what happens, though, the simple first thing you can do just plug back into the quadratic action. So just take this onsatz, plug it back into the effective action, and after a bunch of manipulations, you can arrive that the the, the dominant behavior is the following. So the key thing to notice here is that I have a first order in time kinetic term. So I started normally, as so I started in the UV description with my scalar field as having a second order time derivative, but having this property that I didn't know how to power count. Now I've split the mode into two pieces, phi plus and phi minus, but to keep the number of degrees of freedom, so two propagating modes, they now have to have first order time, time derivatives. Otherwise, they have too many solutions. Um, so, I, so, so this is a common feature that appears in, let's say, non-relativistic theories as well. Now, by construction, I, I basically promoted the constant of the k to 0 limit into a field. And so not surprisingly, in the k to 0 limit, the equations of motion for phi plus or phi minus are just phi plus or minus dot is equal to 0. But this action gives us the higher gradient correction. So first order in, or second order in k, you'll you find a correction that goes like k squared over a squared. In addition, because of this first order time derivative structure, the conjugate moment, the two fields are conjugate momenta of each other. So phi minus is conjugate momenta to phi plus, which also means that the non-zero commutator is between phi plus and phi minus. As a last step, now we can, so, so as, a, as a last step, we still need to match to what is going on to the initial conditions for these fields. So recall, remember, we're following these modes when they have long wavelength, but the time evolution took them from having short wavelength to long wavelength. And so even at some basic technical level of solving differential equations, you say, well, I have to set initial conditions at some point. Now, the easiest way to do this is to take the full theory and just match. And so here, if we take the full answer we saw before and we expand it in the soft limit, well, again, we recover the structure, the AH to the minus alpha and the AH to the minus beta with some order one coefficients and the appropriate powers of K. <coughs> now, you can decompose the phi plus and phi minus fields in terms of those solutions and rewriting them in terms of new creation and annihilation operators, but they're not really creation and annihilation operators anymore. They're just statistical operators because phi plus commutes with itself and or a, a twiddle commutes with itself and b twiddle commutes with itself, but they both have non-zero two-point functions. So these, instead of operators, they become, they look a lot like classical statistical fields. And indeed, what we get is that there's two point functions for the phi plus and phi minus fields that are just classical um, and, and carry the scaling behavior of phi plus. So phi plus behaves like an operator of, behaves like a scaling operator of k to the alpha. Now after Fourier transforming, I get one over k cubed. And so it scales like two alpha, the two point function scales like two alpha over k cubed. But you should see that two alpha and think, ah, that's just telling me that this thing scales like k to the alpha. The, the operator in real space. And similarly, the two beta for the phi minus two point function. And finally, it's really, the, the quantum piece is the commutator between the two. Phi plus and phi minus don't commute. And that's really where the quantum nature of the modes uh, shows up. Okay, so as we discussed in the introduction, <clears throat> Once you have an effective description, you should be able to reconstruct everything you need to know without ever referring back to the UV. This is what it means to, to, to be an effective field theorist, because if, you, if, if, you, if your effective theory is capturing all of the physics at a particular length scale, then you should know what within that length scale, you should be able to reconstruct everything that's happening. The only pieces that you should need as input are the following. So I need to know what my degrees of freedom are. So 
that what the right degrees of freedom at low energy are in some certain sense to fit the sense from the UV, because if I change my UV action, I change my low energy degrees of freedom. So if I added 10 more scalar fields, I'd have to have, have 10 more phi pluses and phi minuses. In addition, the low energy effective action is constrained by symmetries. And many of those symmetries just stand from the UV. So that a certain symmetry is a symmetry of my effective theory is something that, that I, I would have to know from my UV description. But I can also just take it as input. I discover that, my, that there's such a symmetry exists, but then I can use that symmetry to construct the effective theory. Now, normally in an effective theory, that would be the end of your list. But here we also need the initial conditions because our initial conditions, because of this unique feature of de Sitter space, the initial conditions are something that's a special input. <clears throat> but given this list of things, I should be able to construct everything else I need to know. Okay, so, the, so we've, we've already identified our degrees of freedom. So the next thing we need to do is identify the symmetries. Um, so the first symmetry, is, is really a trivial symmetry. It's easy to see. <clears throat> and it's just a, it acts like a scaling symmetry. So if I write, an, it's true for any FRW metric. If I take an FRW metric and write it in terms of real time, I have my, my powers of space always come with powers of A. So I have A squared, A squared DX squared. So now I can, go ahead. You are not using the other SO 1,4 symmetries. Uh, uh, they'll be on the next slide. Oh, uh, okay. Yes. Well, because so the reason I'm splitting them is because this symmetry survives in inflation. Yes. Whereas the full yes. SO uh, SO three one does not. Or SO four one. Sorry. So so so, but we'll we'll get there. So this is just a trivial symmetry of any FRW. It just says the physical the physical scales are x or, or a times x or k over a. That's the physical scale. So I can always trade some, the units of K for powers of A or for the, the normalization of A. So if I change the normalization of A and change the normalization of K, it doesn't change anything physical. And so that's all the, all the scaling symmetry says. <coughs> rescale coordinates, rescale A, everything's the same. Nothing changed. Now, normally this symmetry acts trivially on operators because it's a trivial symmetry. But because of this funny onsets where we factored out the time dependence, now this phi plus and phi minus field are actually scaling operators with dimension alpha and beta under this symmetry. Okay, so that, so in fixed de Sitter space, this symmetry is the dilatation of a conformal like symmetry where the, the full, all of the isometries of de Sitter form an SO41 group. And this, the, the rest of those act like special conformal transformations written here. Now, the special conformal transformations, again, act on the phi and plus and minus fields like they're operators in a conformal field theory of dimension alpha and dimension beta. <clears throat> I'm going to largely ignore this symmetry precisely because I want to emphasize the parts that survive also during inflation. So in inflation, the isometries of De Sitter are broken by the time evolution of the scalar field, but will preserve the dilatation. So the dilatation is still a symmetry, but the, 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 the special conformals or transformations are not. Um, but in, a, in one place, it'll be useful that the special conformal transformation part of the, the De Sitter isometries mix time and space. So that's a piece that, that's not, that's not, that's special to the fact that this is a, the isometries of the sitter and not literally a special conformal transformation noted here by the, the time part of this transformation. So the one place this will be useful is if you ever need to relate things that happen in time and space, you can use the, in, and you're working in the sitter, that allows you to, to, uh, to use the de sitter, this, uh, these isometries. Okay, so those are the, the ones that obviously descend from the UV that are just coming from the metric. Um, there's also a group of um, symmetries that are related to this decomposition. So we took one field and we split it into two. And so there's a residual symmetry related to the fact that that choice was not unique. So in principle, there was many ways I could have split two fields. 
<clears throat> and this symmetry we'll call RPI by analogy with the same, a similar kind of symmetry that appears in heavy quark effective theory. So the symmetry, you can go back to our onsets and just say, look, if I shifted phi plus by some amount of phi minus, and then just change the normalization of phi minus, the, the UV field is the same. And so they're just, this is characterizing the many ways in which I could have split into phi plus and phi minus. <clears throat> now, if I take, if I, if I use the, now let's go to constructing the action. So I have the symmetries and I have the fields. So if I just started with the scaling symmetry and then translations and rotations, and I wanted to write in space that are the properties of the FRW slicing, and I just started writing terms down. At quadratic level in the fields and derivatives, I would write the following action. Now, it's not really important that you look at this. There's a lot of numbers for 10 independent couplings and two independent scaling dimensions. <clears throat> this is very different than what we had in flat space, or sorry, in the, in the, the top-down picture. In the top-down picture, we just, had, we just had one free parameter, alpha or nu, because alpha and beta were fixed, alpha plus beta was three, or we just had alpha and beta were determined in terms of this new parameter. And then we had no independent numbers at quadratic order. So now, of course, we haven't used all of our freedom yet. So now we're going to see that we can get, we can recover the UV description as follows. So the first, I'll, I'll just be schematic. You can go through the, this is all algebra at some level. So the first step is to notice is that one notices that you can perform a field redefinition such that alpha plus beta is always equal to three. Um, this would have already been obvious to you if you use these equations of motion without taking alpha and plus beta equals to three, because you would find that one of the solutions had uh, time evolution at zeroth order and gradients. So the fact that you should always pick alpha plus beta equals to three by the appropriate field redefinition is the same as saying, you should just pick variables phi plus and phi minus so that they have no time evolution and you factored out all the time evolution into the prefactor. <clears throat> the next thing to do is to use this RPI symmetry. So the RPI symmetry relates the phi plus and phi minus fields. That's its role in life is to say those two fields came at a common origin. And what that does is it relates the couplings that have different phi plus and phi minus fields. So if we look at the mass, type terms, there were different mass terms associated with phi plus phi minus, phi minus squared, and phi plus squared. So I gave those different names for the mass. And the RPI symmetry says those are all the same. The same is true for the gradient terms, the kappa variable, and for the time derivatives, which I've used chi here. And, and also remarkably, it relates the second order time derivatives to the first order time derivatives. So the first order time derivative was denoted by rho, and the second order time derivative was by chi, and those are also related by the, the RPI symmetry. Lastly, we can depend, again perform a field redefinition now that shifts the value of alpha minus beta to remove all of the mass terms. So the fact that I can define one mass parameter but using RPI now allows me to completely remove it by a field redefinition. So I remove all the mass terms by one field redefinition. Um, so from here, I now have uh, three numbers, kappa, chi, and, um, and alpha. And now I can use, in fixed to sitter space, I can use these special conformal transformations to relate chi and kappa. And so now I have one overall normalization, which just normalizes my field so I can remove it, and the variable alpha, just like I did in the, the top-down description. So after performing all of those, I can get to the following action. Um, I have a second order time derivative kinetic term, a first order time derivative kinetic term, which exactly matches the one I had before, and the second order gradient term. <clears throat> now, the funny thing that one has to do here is that this is an effective theory. And if I kept all of the time derivative terms um, at quadratic level, I would introduce too many propagating modes. So here I have a second order time derivative, but also two fields, which would give me four propagating solutions. And so to ensure that I'm really only talking about the effective theory, I'm required to use the equations of motion to eliminate higher time derivatives. So I use the lowest time derivative equations of motion to eliminate the higher time derivatives. 
And that means that the second order in time derivatives is really fourth order in spatial derivatives. So I can remove that term and be left only with the action I wrote before, a first order time derivative and a leading gradient term. Now, in terms of these operators, um, we'll also be able to now, now that we've, we've sort of constructed this action, we'll be able to, to do power counting in the following way. So our goal is to power count in the small parameter, k over a h being very small. And we want to count, we want to count sort of powers of this number in the action. Um, so our power counting rule is going to be that, um, that time doesn't count like anything. So the, the, you don't pay any price in small numbers for, for, for powers of time. Um, the spatial coordinates sp x scale like one over our power counting around parameter, momentum scale like the power counting parameter, and our phi plus and phi minus fields scale like, like this power to the alpha and beta, reflecting the fact that our operators are dimension alpha and beta. We're gonna power count in this, and then we're gonna restore all of our units using the UV scale, AH. So you should think of this the same way that you think of an effective theory in flat space. You power count in powers of energy. So you find, you know, our, my operator's dimension one in flat space for phi, and the measure has four powers of, uh, of one over energy to the fourth. And so then I, I combine those things, and then I restore all the units of energy with, my, with the appropriate UV cutoff. And it's exactly the same thing we're going to do here. So now we're going to look for the leading interactions by power counting. So the first thing you would think to do, because you know you're paying a price for every gradient, so the first thing you think is, I don't want to pay any gradient prices, so I should just look at potential terms. So phi plus to the n, phi minus to the m. Now the operator part of this, the phi plus to the n, phi minus to the m, has scaling dimension n times alpha, m times beta. <coughs> so we can also rewrite that remembering that alpha plus beta equals three to write this as three m times the difference of alpha minus, of, of n and m to the alpha. Now again, the measure scales like one over k cubed. And so that tells us that we should replace, we replace the, we fix the units by putting a power of a h to the three minus n alpha minus n beta. Okay, so from here, now we're going to do the same thing we would do in flat space. We're going to we're going to use this power counting to define marginal relevant and irrelevant for the interactions. <clears throat> so if we're just using this power counting, we'd expect that um, this interaction will give us a contribution to some correlator that scales like k over a h to the n alpha plus m beta minus three. So when this power is negative, that means I have powers of a h upstairs, powers of k downstairs, and this thing is growing with time. It's getting bigger as a h goes, uh, to z go goes to infinity. So we'll call that relevant in exact analogy with RG. It's becoming more important at long times. When this power is zero, we'll call that marginal because it's not, it's not more important but not less important as time evolves. When this power is positive, the corrections you get from this interaction are suppressed by k over a h. And so we'll call it irrelevant because it becomes less important as k over h becomes smaller. Okay, so now let's just figure out what the leading interactions are. Your first guess by this power counting would be phi plus to the n. <clears throat> um, this thing in principle could be, uh, could be relevant because um, if you take n times alpha to be less than three, then this thing has, then the naive scaling of this operator is such that this thing is relevant. However, it turns out that this thing is actually not an operator in the theory, and it can be removed by the following fielder definition. Now, this, this might strike you as some strange thing uh, if you haven't encountered it before. <coughs> you'd be worried that, well, how do I know what's going on? If this looks like a good operator to me, how would I know ahead of time that I can remove it? And the trick is that if you went to calculate anything with this operator, um, you went to calculate any correlator with this term, you would immediately see that it doesn't contribute. Or, and it uh, at the very least doesn't contribute at the order and power counting you'd expect. And that's because five plus commutes with itself. 
So if you, if you were to write an in-in correlator, you would find that it just doesn't enter into the correlator, that it can commute right with the fields you're trying to calculate and doesn't do anything. And so this fact that it doesn't contribute, that you could see just by brute force calculation, you then realize is a consequence of this fact that I could have removed it in the first place. So instead, the leading interaction is the following, phi plus to the n, phi minus. Now this thing for positive alpha is always irrelevant because remember alpha plus beta is always three and three is what sets the question of whether this is relevant or irrelevant. So for n greater than two, which is what's true for any interaction greater than or equal to two, this thing always has to mention greater than three. And so this thing will always, so for any positive mass or any alpha greater than zero, these interactions are irrelevant. Therefore, we can, we can write the action up to leading order in, <clears throat> in gradients as the following. Um, we have the leading time, and then we have some finite number of interactions up to some max where, where the, con the suppression because of powers of alpha means that it's less important than the leading gradient. But there's some finite list of phi plus the n phi minuses. All of them are still irrelevant for positive mass. And this is the full theory at, at this order. <clears throat> in addition, we have to impose these initial conditions that we again got by fixing it to the UV theory. Um, so again, I can, my input is these phi plus and phi minus uh, two point functions. Okay, so I promised that I would explain these different facts about EFT. So, <clears throat> The next step is um, I want to explain how we're actually going to calculate. So I promise that the trick here is that we'll make calculations easier. And so part of the trick of making calculations easier is, is the type of effective theory uh, approach we're using. So the way which we, is most convenient for thinking about why effective field theory works is called Wilsonian effective theory. And here what what's one's doing is you're really integrating out in the path integral in this formal way. So we start with a full theory that's defined up to some very high scale. And then we're just performing a path integral over the, the high scales first. And then we're gonna do a perturbation theory, for example, for the low energy scales. When you're doing Wilsonian effective theory, I really have a hard cutoff in mind. So I'm really bringing the cutoff down to the energy that I, or the scale that I care about. But because I have a hard cutoff, I have exactly this problem. My power, my power law divergences are still always showing up as powers of my hard cutoff, and I have to absorb them by hand. In addition, this way of thinking where I really do the integral down to some scale with some hard cutoff breaks many of the symmetries. And I will also have to restore those by hand um, if I want my full theory to say be Lorentz invariant or have other properties. And this is a reflection of the fact that in a lot of ways, the Wilsonian approach is still really doing the whole calculation. You're still solving the full theory just in two steps. One integrating out at the path integral level first, and then at a second step performing perturbation theory at the low energies. But I'm still doing all of those steps myself. <clears throat> and this is where continuum effective field theory really is, becomes more powerful. So in continuum effective field theory, I really just have two totally different theories at, at short distance. But I, I create, I match my two theories so that at long distance, they give the same physics. So my, my continuum of EFT is defined over the same range of scales as the full theory. They're not the same theory at short distance, but I've just defined the theories in such a way that they're exactly the same theory at long distance. Now, this at first sight seems troubling. You're like, well, how do I know these? How, how can I guarantee that I can match these theories at long distance? And the trick is, again, to go back to this simple argument I gave at the beginning, which is that when you perform this path integral over the short distance physics, all it can do is change the coefficients of the long wavelength effective action. And so the trick here is that, yes, the short distance physics is different, but because all that short distance is doing is changing the effective action, I can change my short distance physics and change the effective action and hold long distance, fit, hold long distance physics fixed. So what I'm doing here is I'm not putting a hard cutoff. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm defining a theory 
in a totally different way. So I, I, my theory is defined to be the same at long distance, but now I just say that the long distance theory continues to short distance. <coughs> and I simply define all my answers by analytic continuation. So for example, if I'm trying to ca calculate the Gaussian two point function for the phi squared operator, <coughs> instead of a putting some hard cutoff in P, now I just say, look, I have, this integral is defined over all P. I don't cut it off. I don't say my theory, effective theory is only defined over a finite range of P. Instead, I just declare that it obeys the same power laws as before at the, as the long, wa long wavelength theory. And then I define my answers by analytic continuation. And so when, by doing this, I don't break any of the symmetries, but also my analytic continuation is such that I only pick up the, the physical scale in the problem, K. So when I do this integral over P, <clears throat> even though this thing can be power law divergent than P, the final answer only picks up powers of K. And the, the powers of K I'd expect by, by my, my, my naive power count. So this way of doing calculations, this continuum EFT way of doing calculations has the advantage of preserved symmetry and preserves power count. So if I guess the size of a correction and I do a loop integral, that size is preserved. I don't have these powers of the UV scale floating around in my loops anymore. <clears throat> okay, so the, ne the, the other funny thing in our effective theory is that I had two kinds of integrals. I'm gonna have evolution in time and I have the time integrals that come from time evolution. And I have these loop integrals from integrating over momenta. And in a lot of cases, these two will factorize because of the way we've split the time and momentum. Now again, your intuition would be, well, this time integral is running from the time that crosses the horizon until the time I, I compute my correlator. So I'm tempted to replace the time integrals by one that has a cutoff at early times and late times. Doing calculations this way has all of the same limitations as the hard momentum cutoffs. So we could think of this way of calculating as being the same as this Wilsonian EFT. And so, it's, so just like we did for the momentum integrals, the time evolution we're gonna deal with by this continuum EFT approach. We're gonna see a bunch of time integrals that are just power laws. And instead of putting a hard cut off in the early times, the early times are just setting the initial conditions. So instead of continuously changing the initial conditions perturbatively, I fix the initial conditions by matching and I define all my time integrals by analytic continuation. So when I see an integral over a power law in A, I only pick up an hour, the power law part of the integral. This is ex the exact answer for positive powers of A, but now I just continue them to negative powers of A. The last thing that one needs to remember from, um, one needs to remember from uh, uh, flat space EFT is that occasionally there are things that look like zero in uh, when we calculate, power, when we calculate um, loop integrals that are actually both UV and IR divergent. And in those cases, we need to isolate the UV part and pick it out. So for example, uh, even in flat space, if I saw something that was like D3P over P to the three minus alpha, <clears throat> dim reg or a dim reg like regulator would say that this power, this is, this integral is literally zero because it has no scale. But as I take alpha to zero, this is actually a UV divergence minus an IR divergence that I've set to zero. And it's standard EFT uh, practice to say when you do that, you're, what you're really supposed to do is regulate the IR by hand and extract the UV. The, it extract the UV divergence because the UV divergence is signaling RG and the IR divergence is signaling the fact that you haven't done RG yet. So you should just regulate it by hand to isolate the UV and then uh, either the, the, the IR divergence will be solved by using inclusive, uh, uh, calculating inclusive quantities or, per, or solved by the RG at flow itself or both. But either way, this is the standard solution. You just you pick some way of regulating. And as long as you're consistent about how you regulate the IR and extract the UV in this way, you'll, you'll arrive at consistent answers. Okay, and so my rain, rem, remaining time, uh, we'll apply this, uh, to this effective theory to, to two cases. 
So first we're gonna, we're gonna apply it to our correlators uh, in a fixed acidic background. Um, so in the, in the UV description, I described how you calculate an in-in correlator by wick rotating the contours so that it became an anti-time order con contour in Euclidean time. In our EFT, it's actually easier to work with the commutator form of in-in. So uh, in, in the commutator form, you had Hamiltonians on the left and Hamiltonians on the right that differed by a sign. <clears throat> and so by bringing those things down order by order, you can write those as commutators of the initial operator. So H, the interacting Hamiltonian, is commuting with the interaction picture, picture fields. Now, this is exactly what I was saying, why the phi plus uh, to the n operator doesn't contribute, because if I was calculating phi plus correlators, all of those commutators vanish. <coughs> so in addition, <clears throat> we see that that's why we need these powers of phi minus, because we get interesting contributions. These commutators act between the H, inter the H interaction and the phi plus fields. You can also think of this as just at leading order implementing the equations of motion. So the first commutator, if I just acted on a single field and brought it down, this phi minus phi plus interaction has the effect of just implementing the equation, classical equations of motion. Now, this isn't important as for all practical purposes, we can use, just use this commutator form, but just to understand that what this commutator form is doing at leading order is the same as applying the equations of motion, the nonlinear equations of motion to the fields. Okay, so the first thing you can do is just take a massive correlator with, let's say, what you would get from starting with a phi four interaction, which is, would have four powers of the field, but here that means phi plus cubed phi minus. <clears throat> and you can just now calculate relatively straightforward. So at tree level, you just get this initial conditions piece for the power spectrum. At one loop, you get zero. And this is, a, this is one of these standard dim reg zeros. You have D3P over uh, times P to some power that's not one over P cubed. And so that thing is just zero by analytic continuation. And so the first non-zero you answer you get is at two loops. The full answer in the EFT scales like K over AH to the four alpha, which is what you'd get from power counting. So again, you see the structure that as I compute higher and higher loops, I get answers that are suppressed compared to the leading answer by powers of K over AH. <clears throat> and this is exactly what you expect from an irrelevant interaction. So the, the fact that we said this power counts like an, in an as an irrelevant interaction is reflected by this answer we're getting. We're getting, as we calculate higher and higher loops, we're getting things that are more and more suppressed by our small parameter, K over AH. Now that's not to say that there aren't interesting things that can happen um, in, um, when we, in massive correlators, because as we saw, when you have composite operators, you can get interesting, you can get interesting anomalous dimensions. And the same thing is true here. So we can still construct the composite phi plus squared operator. <clears throat> and that came from the four point, integrating over the four point function. And indeed, by doing that, one will, will again extract this D3P over P cubed divergence. Now, again, this is easy to see. It's still hard to regulate even in the effect of theory. But now the trick is to analytically continue in these alpha parameters. So in particular, there's a particular way to analytically continue in the, in the, around, let's say, alpha equals one that makes it easy to extract the pole um, that we saw before. So we, by analytically continuing these alphas, we extract something that looks like uh, one over alpha minus one pole. Now I've already chosen alpha equals one as my sort of goal uh, dimension. And again, we recover this log. And following our nose again, standard RG, but now dynamical RG, we can resum that correlator to get, um, to get the K to the four alpha plus two gamma. Now here, this is slightly different than what we calculated before because these phi plus variables stripped off a bunch of powers of AH. So the time evolution looks different than it did in the previous case, simply because we've defined phi plus in a particular way. But this anomalous scaling 
to the two gamma survives um, and is easier to extract. And then we didn't have to keep subleading powers of k or, or calculate non perturbatively k. Now, the more interesting case is what happens when you start taking alpha to zero. So that corresponds to massless scalars. So as we take alpha to zero, the dimension of all of our interactions are approaching three, of all of our potential interactions, phi plus the n minus one phi minus are all approaching dimension three because alpha is going to zero. Furthermore, this also means that operators of phi plus to the n are all becoming degenerate because they all have the same power because they scale like just powers of the dimension counts like alpha, but alpha to the n when alpha goes to zero is still zero. And so what that means is under this dynamical RG, we should start expecting these operators to mix. So for example, phi plus to the n now fixes with phi plus to the n minus two, already just by simply with contracting two of those fields, <coughs> we see that there's a log divergence as alpha goes to zero. This D3P over three to the two minus alpha, uh, three minus two alpha, that becomes as alpha goes to zero. Of course, this is exactly the kind of log that we uh, recognize um, even in flat space that we should pick out and, uh, and, and use RG to resolve. And so the RG for this for, for, uh, in the alpha to zero limit just becomes this equation for the mixing of operators under time evolution. Um, the, the log we isolated is the second term on the right. And the term in the middle of this expression is just the classical time evolution. So the same way that the Callan-Semanzic equation turns an anomalous dimension into the total dimension um, by, by changing to physical, physical coordinates. Here, turning this mixing equation into mixing in physical time introduces the classical equations of motion. Now, this expression here is actually equivalent to Starobinsky's uh, 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 stochastic inflation formalism. And so the mixing of operators here is the same as some random walk on the, uh, introduced by the quantum noise and classical evolution on the potential. One of the useful things about this way of doing things though is that we immediately see that there can't be mixing with operators that are not the same dimension as phi plus to the n. So for example, gradients power count like additional powers of one over a and so they have a higher dimension and won't mix with phi plus. So we can immediately conclude there's no gradient corrections to stochastic inflation. You could even go further and check that a large number of the terms you might imagine writing down are actually already absorbed into the EFT parameters. Okay, to conclude, we're gonna talk just quickly, coming back to this motivation from the beginning about metric fluctuations. So, so we'll talk about metric fluctuations during inflation so that we can capture both zeta and gamma. Um, so inflation breaks the time translation symmetry of, the, of flat space by some background time evolving scalar field. And the, but because we're coupling to gravity, this, the scalar mode we'd associate with the Goldstone boson is eaten by the metric and becomes a scalar mode of the metric, which we were called zeta in, in the beginning. Now, in addition, of course, the metric had this tensor degrees of freedom, the gravitational waves, which we call gamma. <clears throat> and so for, during inflation, we have the metric fluctuations have these three propagating modes. Now, because the, the symmetry of the background is broken, we're allow, we can allow interactions in the theory of, the, of these metric fluctuations that break Lorentz boosts. So they can depend only on time or space, <clears throat> and that's, those can be uh, understood as using powers of the derivatives of the, the background field. Um, but in addition, there, because um, these are fluctuations of the metric, there are also gauge freedoms associated with uh, diffeomorphisms. So in particular, the zeta field has a nonlinearly realized symmetry associated with large diffeomorphisms um, where instead of changing scaling x the coordinates and scaling the scale factor we instead shift the background value of zeta and that also leaves the metric invariant um, <clears throat> now demanding that this is a symmetry this nonlinear symmetry is a symmetry of effective theory has two consequences first 
if it forces that the growing mode has, has alpha equals zero as its power law. That's the only allowed value of alpha that's consistent with this nonlinear shift. The second thing that this does is that it, it eliminates the potential terms from the interactions because it, the nonlinearly realized symmetry requires that there are at least two derivatives on any interaction. This same property is true of the, um, of the tensor mode. So there's a more complicated nonlinearly realized symmetry. Um, and these nonlinear, the, um, and these nonlinearly realized symmetries um, are still have the same impact though. They force that the growing mode of the gravitational wave has alpha equals zero and the interactions of the gravitational waves comes with two derivatives. This forces the following on us, the action of our, of our effective theory takes the following form. It's our first order time derivative kinetic terms plus terms that are always suppressed by at least A over AH and are always irrelevant. So for example, the leading interactions that we might write down are the, the form written here. Because of the derivatives, they always come with power over AH just from the, the contraction of the metric. As a result, just by power counting, we know that if we compute corrections to the initial conditions by including these interaction terms, they have to scale like k over h squared, okay? at least k squared of h squared. And so now we see that all of this all order conservation is just a consequence of power counting. That it's just the statement that the leading interactions are irrelevant and thus become unimportant as we take time to infinity. This is, and again, we see this is now trivially true, not just for the adiabatic modes, which had been previously been, been proven, but it's also true for the tensor modes, which had previously been too complicated because of all of the tensor structure. Now, it's worth pointing out that this is still, there's, this is morally the same as one of the previous arguments, which was able to at least get this down, problem to the following form, that the time evolution of zeta was, what could be written as an operator equation in terms of nonlinear powers of, of zeta with derivatives, but without this manifest power counting, without being able to calculate contractions of fields um, in, in space or loop integrals of momentum in a way that preserved power counting, you needed to then use this complicated diagrammatic argument to show that just because the operators O were derivatively suppressed, that the final answer would be suppressed by powers of k over h. And so what our effective theory has done is made that last step trivial. It's just now we calculate in such a way that, that all the things that we are gonna calculate will preserve power count. Okay, so to summarize, um, what we've done here is we've produced an effective theory um, for the soft modes in the sitter space. When the, these fields are massive, we found that all interactions are irrelevant and, um, and thus correlators are dominated by what happens at horizon crossing. For massless quantum fields, we found that some of the interactions become marginal and there can be mixing between an infinite set of operators. And the dynamical RG equations for the mixing of these operators was the same thing as stochastic inflation. Next, we showed that the self interactions of the, the metric fluctuations are all irrelevant and that the power counting associated with the fact that they're irrelevant is the same thing as the all orders conservation of zeta and gamma. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so thank you very much, Daniel, for your very nice and elaborative talk. And you were exactly on time. You have to. That's partly luck because uh, there were questions. Yeah, yeah. so like, People left, as I can see, because it is a really big talk. But uh, yeah, like uh, Abhinash, you have any question? Uh, no, not really. Like, uh, it was a nice talk, but uh, I joined a little late, but uh, it was a good talk. So, but I don't have any questions particularly. No, just I, I uh, since it is recorded, I would suggest people can also write to Daniel. He can give answers. Yeah, so, I'm happy. Yes. I'm ha happy to respond to email questions. Yeah, so. because like I don't want to like uh, disturb Daniel because it is already too much morning and 
the content is huge and uh, probably daniel this is your longest talk ever I uh yeah it's def definitely for research talk it's the longest yeah. I've given. so i'm I, as i said i apologize for the for, for perhaps the bumps in in sorting this out no, this no, no, no. i'm i'm very picture. happy that you gave the whole picture uh because since it is posted people uh, for uh, students and everybody those who are following the eft business for them it is it will be really interesting because you have said everything here yes okay well hope, and, yes uh, okay. yeah so uh, i have to say thank you and uh, stay safe and Likewise. Uh, like we may talk uh, through email or maybe some regarding some the things I have written to you. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Now maybe it is not a good option to talk, but later maybe once you feel free, you, we can talk. Okay, excellent. Well, thanks again for inviting me, and thanks for those of you who stayed for the whole two hours. It's no, quite, uh... no uh, yeah. So. So I will write to you uh, when you have time, just uh, give me a response. That's yep, understood. Yeah.